several years ago I was serving in a church in uh, Arkansas and this church every Sunday morning had uh, a special time during the main service uh, called the uh, children's time and you may have been at churches that do this we don't do this here um, because it makes me t way too nervous um, but what they would do is they would put something into a box and the pastor would have all the little kids come down and he would open the box and then he would on the spot have to make up some sort of spiritual truth or devotional based on what was in the box. And this one particular Sunday, Easter Sunday, someone really, you know, threw him a softball kind of pitch and they put an Easter basket, which was a bucket that had like Easter bunnies and stuff on it into the basket. And as was normal, he pulled out this bucket and he kind of looked at it and he passed it around to all of the kids so they could all see it and as he was passing it around this one little kid who I guess at the time was about six years old kid named Preston he took the bucket and he put it on his head like a helmet and he said I'm a bucket head and everybody ha 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 kind of laughed and then the pastor said okay Preston hand the bucket back and he said, I'm not Preston, I'm Buckethead. So then the pastor said, okay, Buckethead, give, us the, give me the bucket back. And he did and you know, kind of went on from there. Well, for the next few weeks, the kids, the other kids there started calling him Buckethead. In fact, uh, the very next week, I was, it was my week to do children's church, the separate sort of concurrent session after the children's time. And while I was in there with a bunch of the teenagers, they all were calling him Buckethead. Ten years later, I ran into his grandmother, whose name was Carol, and she came up to me. She said, Chip, how are you? I heard you went to the seminary and all this kind of things. And it was one of those things where, like, I knew her face. I even knew her name, but I couldn't quite connect the dots, and she sensed that, right? And she sensed that, and she said, you, you know me from Cornerstone, I'm Buckethead's mom, <laughs> grandma, Buckethead's grandma. And I said, oh yes, Preston, how is Preston doing? He says, well, Buckethead's driving now. <laughs> now it's one thing if you call yourself Buckethead and then the other kids in church start calling you Buckethead, but when your grandma self-identifies as Buckethead's grandma, something's gone wrong, right? Something's gone wrong somewhere. And she did, right? And I'm sure, like, right now, there's, like, a 23-year-old bucket head. I, you know, I have no idea where the kid's gone or what he's done. But, you know, like, he could be a graduate of MIT, like, doing rocket science at NASA right now. But when he goes home, he's still bucket head. Last week, I had a bucket head moment. I had a bucket head moment because here I called on someone in the congregation to answer a question. I asked Kyle, I asked Kyle to explain a visual aid, an aid that I had used some months earlier. And he made a guess and it wasn't even close to right, right? And I, I kind of joked with him about it, but, and I went back and I found out that he was not here on the Sunday yeah, so I, I, oh, I feel horrible. And so I don't want Kyle to have the reputation of being, you know, like forgetful Kyle or, or anything like that. And so I went back through the Sunday school records. To, and that's, this is the whole reason we keep Sunday school records is so that I can know when you're here and not. And I found a Sunday that Kyle was teaching. And so, Kyle, here's your chance at redemption, my friend. Kyle... What does this rope represent? Oh, come on, man. You can't go be over to Kyle. Okay, so yeah. What does this whole rope represent? Our eternal life. Good job, whoever else chimed in to help Kyle. Jackson, good job. Right, it represents our eternal life. And so this rope starts here and goes on forever, out the door and around the whole world, over and over and over again, never ending. And what does this little orange part represent? Thanks, Kyle. Good job, Jackson. He was gonna say that, right? It, 
It represents your life on earth. And so we use this to say, hey, listen, your life on earth is just a little, a little while. And so don't make you know, decisions here that are gonna impact eternity in a negative way. All right, so very good. So now Kyle, is, you've gotten your chance at redemption and that's important because those little things, those little moments, those little snapshots of your life sometimes can define who you are. There are people who their entire lives are defined by just the narrowest window of time. Today we're gonna look at a man whose life and reputation, well definitely his reputation, seems to have been defined by just a few moments of his life. Today we're gonna look in John chapter 20. We're gonna look at the story of a man named Thomas. The scripture when it refers to him calls him Thomas the twin but you and I know him better as, yeah, Doubting Thomas. In fact, this is, I've got a, a picture for you to look at. This is a painting by the Italian artist Caravaggio, and this is his depiction of the moment when Thomas comes face to face to encounter Jesus. Now this is a beautiful painting, but it's absolutely wrong. We're going to find out why in, in John chapter 20. We're going to start reading in verse 24. Verse 24 says this, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now, Jesus has already been making appearances. Jesus has already been resurrected. The women went early to the tomb. They did not find his body. One of the women, Mary Magdalene, is described earlier in John chapter 20 that she went to the tomb, couldn't find Jesus' body, and then she goes and tells the disciples. And then two of the disciples raced to the tomb. In fact, the two disciples are Peter and John. Sometimes, this will be for you sort of Bible scholar people, sometimes when John refers to him, refers to himself in the book of John. He doesn't use his own name. He calls himself the beloved disciple or the disciple Jesus loved or sometimes just the other disciple. In John chapter 20, he refers to himself three times as the other disciple. And here's the thing. Sometimes, and I'm going to just beat on John for a minute. Sometimes we think, oh, John was doing this as some form of humility. But if you read John chapter 20, and I'll invite you to do it, read the first section of John chapter 20, you will say, wait a minute, John doesn't seem very humble. And if you read it, you'll figure out why. Um, and I'd encourage you to do that today after church, maybe over lunch. Read the first few verses of John chapter 20 and figure out why it is that I don't think John's so humble after all. But they go to the tomb and they don't find Jesus. And what they find instead is they find an angel who tells him that Jesus is gone. The women find an angel. Mary Magdalene comes face to face with Jesus and she goes and tells the disciple, I have seen the Lord. The disciples then see the Lord, but Thomas wasn't there. He missed it. He just, he just wasn't there. Sometimes that happens to us, right? You maybe you're part of a group of friends and for, that, for some reason that one night you didn't go to the potluck. You didn't go on the trip, you didn't go whatever, and then it seems like for the rest of your life, every joke they make is about the one time you weren't there. Thomas wasn't there, they all saw Jesus. And he says, if I'm gonna believe what you're telling me, I need to see it with my own eyes and I need to feel it with my own hands. I need that. If I'm gonna believe, this is what I need. See, Thomas, what he's doing is he's setting sort of his own threshold. He says, listen, some people might believe just from hearing you. Some people will even believe by seeing, but I need to not only hear and see, I need to feel Jesus. I need to feel his body to know that this is real, that this isn't just your imagination. So he sets his threshold of what he needs. And then this happens in verse 26. In so verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again. They were all together in the, in the same room and Thomas was with them this time. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. I sometimes wonder, you know, this is maybe just me, but I wonder how Jesus did that, not like how he actually accomplished it, but when he was like deciding, okay, I'm gonna just appear in the room. Now, 
did he like uh, just sort of like appear, materialize in the middle of the room where they were all looking and they just like kind of saw him like Star Trek transporter style, like, or here's I think how I would have done it. Like I would have just kind of like appeared kind of at the back of the room and just waited to see how long it took him to notice. Right? Wouldn't you love to be the Jesus like sitting there when the first one looks over and sees you and he's like, yeah, oh yeah, that food at that place really is bad. I don't like their kebabs at all. Do you like that? Whoa, it's Jesus, right? Like, that's just me. Maybe Jesus isn't a prankster, but he just appears and in whatever way he appeared, it frightened them. It, it unsettles them because he says, calm down. He says, don't worry. Peace, peace be with you. Be calm. Don't, don't be upset. Don't be frightened by the fact that I'm here. And in verse 27, verse 27, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And this is what we see depicted again and again for Thomas is this idea of disbelief. And Jesus invites him, go ahead, touch me, feel. Now, sometimes we, we maybe get the idea that Jesus is, is kind of like barbing Thomas, right? That maybe that he's picking on him like, oh, you wouldn't believe unless you see. Well, here I am. You wouldn't believe unless you touch. Go ahead and touch me. But I don't get that sense from Jesus. I don't get that sense from Jesus because I never get that sense from Jesus. Like there's no point in, in the scriptures where Jesus is mocking. He's not a mocker. That's not what he does. There are times when he's playful, but there's, there's never a time when Jesus is just, you know, trying to, you know, put the screws to somebody. He doesn't do that. What Jesus is doing is he's saying, Thomas, you said you couldn't just hear, you said you couldn't just see, but that you needed to touch to believe. If that's what you need to believe in me, then come and do it. His, his goal here isn't to mock Thomas. His goal here isn't to belittle Thomas. His goal isn't to give Thomas the reputation of being a doubter. His, his goal is to give Thomas the reputation of being a believer. He says, this is what you need to believe. I will meet you right there. You need to touch, you can touch me. You need to see, you can see me. Whatever it is that you need from me so that you believe in me, I will do it. See, when we think of Thomas, we think of Thomas as, as a doubting Thomas. We think of a doubter. Jesus didn't see that. Jesus didn't see him that way because Jesus' experiences with Thomas were much longer. He had three years of experiences with Thomas. In fact, later on in this chapter, it says that if all of the stories of Jesus and the disciples were written down, that it would be a book much longer than this one. And he says, there's no way I could tell you everything that happened. So we, there were countless experiences that Jesus had had with Thomas, but there are two before this that really stand out in my mind. Two before this that stand out where not only do we know Thomas was there, but Thomas speaks. In fact, in John chapter 14, Jesus is telling the disciples, he's saying, listen, I'm not going to be with you forever. He says, I, I'm, I'm leaving this place. He says, where I'm going, you will follow. He tells them, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would not have told you. But in my father's house, there are many rooms or in, in his kingdom, there are many mansions. He says, I'm going to prepare one of those places. And if I prepare a place for you, then surely I will return to you and bring you back with me so that you can be with me. And Thomas speaks up and he says, hey, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way to get there? What's Thomas' interest? His interest is being with Jesus. Does he express any doubt? No. His only doubt is in himself and his ability to find Jesus. And he says, I don't know where you're going. How can I get there? And Jesus responds in one of the most famous statements Jesus makes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The other instance where Thomas talks is in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, it's the story of, of Lazarus, one of Jesus' friends, that he has gotten ill and he's died. And that in spite of the calls from Lazarus' sisters for Jesus to come and heal him, Jesus waits. He waits until Lazarus is dead, and then he says, we'll go to Lazarus' town and we'll heal him. And the disciples are like, Jesus, um, we don't want to, you know, really dwell on a, a tough subject, but 
the last time that we were in Lazarus's town, all of the people tried to kill us. I, I know this may be a sensitive thing for you, but uh, can, I, I don't really, we don't want to go back to the town where they were actively trying to kill us. If it's all the same to you, Jesus. And Jesus says, we're going. I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead. I'm going because he's only asleep. And they're like, uh, no, he's dead. And if we go there, we're going to be dead too. And Thomas says, let's go with him that we can die with him. Thomas says, it's better for me to follow Jesus and die by his side than to stay here and live. There's no doubt in that. There's certainty in that. There's confidence in that. There's belief in that. But that's not what we do. We take a snapshot. We take one moment in time. We take one, one page in the book of someone's life and we say, that's who they are. That's who they are. We put one adjective in front of somebody's name and that's them forever. They're always forgetful Kyle. They're always Buckethead Preston. They're always doubting Thomas. The next few verses in this story, I think, are really telling. Chapter, verse 28 says, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. He calls him my Lord, which is, he's been his Lord for a while. He's followed him, but then he calls him my God. That's not a thing that you just say to somebody that you like a little bit. He recognizes who Jesus is. He believes. Because he touched him? No. He didn't touch him. He sees and he believes the same as all of the other disciples. He sees and he believes. He calls him my Lord and my God. And when Jesus answers him, when Jesus speaks to him again in verse 29, he, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Assuming that the answer is yes. And he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now this isn't saying that Thomas isn't blessed. Thomas is blessed. He's seen the resurrected Lord. He has seen the resurrected Jesus he is blessed. But he's saying that there are others who will believe without seeing, and they too will be blessed. Thomas, Thomas never touched him. And yet, that's always the picture. The picture is always Thomas reaching to touch his side, feeling the holes in his hands from the nails. Because that's what we do. We take that snapshot of somebody's life and say, that's them. That's them. He's a liar. He's a cheater. He's a thief. He's an adulterer. He's a fornicator. He's a homosexual. He's no good. He's dirty. He's rotten. When he was two years old, he was such a brat. We do that. We take these little snapshots and we apply it to people's lives for the rest of their lives. And friends, we don't need to do that. We certainly didn't need to do that with Thomas, but we don't need to do that with anybody because everyone you know has a story. This is the third week we've talked about this idea of telling a good story. The first week we said that your story, the story of God's redeeming purposes in your life is powerful. It's powerful. We looked at a story of a woman whose story changed an entire town. The next week we said that your story is worth retelling. It's worth remembering. It's worth memorializing. This week, what I want you to know is that your story is long. Your story is long. It is not just a snapshot. It's not just a snapshot. It's not just a moment. It's not one page long. Your story is is chapters and books and volumes long. It's a movie stretching across 70, 80 years. It isn't what happened in that one moment. It isn't that one time. It isn't the one time that you were cruel to that person. It isn't that one time that you were too lazy to do the right thing and so you just did nothing. That's not your whole story. Your story's longer than that. Your story isn't the one sin. Your story isn't the one struggle. Your story isn't the one thing. Your story is long. And what we have to do as Christians is first, we need to give other people the grace to let their story be long. We, 
We can hold a lot of things as Christians, but grudges isn't one of them. We have to allow people to have, receive grace from us to let their story be long and to say, you know what? I had a snapshot of that person's life and that snapshot, it isn't all of their life. I have this one snapshot of that man, of that woman, of that child. I have one picture of them, but their story is much longer than that. We need to have the grace to feel that way for other people's sake. But even if you never did that, even if you were people that held grudges forever, you've got to do this. And that is give yourself the grace to let your story be long. Give yourself the grace to recognize that your story isn't that one moment. Your story isn't that one picture, that one snapshot. It isn't this narrow moment, but it's longer than that. Your story stretches on for years and years and years. Now, I don't know what your story has been up to today. I don't know what your story is coming into this place. I, I got, I've been telling people this morning that they've noticed that I'm wearing you know, a, a vest and a coat, but no tie. And that's because I still haven't found my ties in the boxes in the garage, right? I, I, don't, like, I don't know where my ties are, much less where the bodies are buried. Right? I don't know what skeletons are in what closets. I have no idea what your story is. I have no idea, but here's the thing, promise I can make to you. I, can, I will give you the grace that even if I ever do hear of that snapshot in your story, I'll recognize your story is way longer than that snapshot. Your, your story is longer than that reputation you gained that one day or that one week, that one month, that one season, that one year. Your story is longer than that. I know that, I will treat you that way. I pray that you treat me that way, but most of all, I pray that you treat yourself that way because you may be here this morning just because it's Easter and you just feel like you're supposed to be in church on Easter. You may have no commitment to Christ Jesus. You might be here because you know that if you're not in church on Sunday, Nana is gonna write you out of the will. Hey, I, I feel you, right? Maybe that's why I have no idea what your story is, but I know this, I know your story's long. I know that this is one page of your story and that the rest of your story hasn't been written yet. You're writing it right now. And so the story may be, the story may be that you're a loser, that you're forgetful, that you're an adulterer. Your story may have been that you're a fornicator or a liar or arrogant. Your story may have been that you're untrustworthy or dumb or worthless. Your story may have been that you're prideful but that doesn't have to be your whole story. That doesn't have to be your whole story. Your story's long. Thomas's story was long. We only have a few verses about him in the book of John, but I can tell you from the history of the church and the, what we see in the New Testament, Thomas's story goes on quite a while. In fact, he's there a few days later when Jesus goes fishing with the disciples, sometimes called the miraculous catch. He's there when Jesus says, no, 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 cast your nets over here. Cast your nets the way I tell you, and you're not going to just be catchers of fish. You'll be fishers of men. Cast your nets the way I tell you, and I will give you in a, a catch that you've never seen. He was there. He was there when Jesus ascended into heaven. He was there when Jesus showed him the place where he was going. He was there, and he watched him as he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God. Tom, Thomas was there for that. He saw that. Thomas was there some days later on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God descended on the disciples, now apostles, as tongues of flame, when they began to speak in all sorts of languages to spread the gospel to thousands of people there. He was there for that, but he didn't stay there for long because history tells us that Thomas, instead of staying in Jerusalem, Thomas went east. Thomas went into Syria and then into Persia, or modern-day Iran, he then went into India, and when he was in India, he was trying to spread the gospel and found no success until one day he came across a community of Jews, 40 different Jews. He shared the gospel with them, and they converted in one day. And he established the first Christian church in India. Across the next 20 years, he continued to minister in India, baptizing over 3,000 Indians in the Indian subcontinent, establishing seven total churches in India. 
He established so many believers that uh, hundreds of years later when other believers came into the area thinking they were taking the gospel there for the first time, they found churches, they found Christians to partner with. Thomas spent 20 years there doing ministry until one day his life was ended on the tip of a spear, just like Jesus. See, Thomas said, how can we follow you? How can, we, how can we go if we don't know the way? And Jesus says, this is the way, Thomas. He says, this is the way. You follow me, you do what I tell you, and he did. He says, this is the way. You cast your nets the way I tell you to cast them, and you will get a, a catch like you couldn't imagine, and he does. Jesus says, follow me. He says, Thomas, do you need to feel the spot where the spear hit my side? And Thomas answered by saying, no, I'll get my own. He says, I don't need to actually touch the hole in your side, but I will follow you even unto death until the point that a spear pierces my own side. See, Thomas's story, oh man, it was long and it was good. Thomas wasn't going to be defined by that one moment. My hope and prayer for you today is that you're not letting yourself be defined by just one moment. That you're not letting yourself be defined by the worst moment in your past, but that instead you look and say, you know what, my story, my story is long. It is longer than the reputation that maybe I'd earned or the reputation maybe somebody gave me undeservedly. My story is longer than that. Again, I don't know what your story is, but I know what your story could be. I know what your story could be. Your story could be powerful. Your story could be worth memorializing. Your story could be amazing. And it still can be because your story is long. You may have come here today as having the reputation of being something. My prayer is that your reputation won't be coming out of here what it was coming into here. I hope that you will set your sights on building the reputation that God wants for you to have. Pray that you'll set your sights on being changed by the power of the gospel because it has the power to transform lives. This morning, you may be here and you may be prideful. I pray that you won't be too proud to say, I need a relationship with Jesus Christ. I pray that you won't be too proud to say, I need to forgive that person. I need to forgive them for what they did. I need to give them the grace to let their story be long. I pray that you will find the grace to let your own story be long. Let's pray together. Most gracious Father, we thank you for this celebration of the resurrection. I thank you that you have given us a story that is much longer than a snapshot. I thank you for the cross. I thank you that the cross says that we are loved in spite of our sin. I thank you that you're, for your death, a death that says that we are valued beyond our abilities. I thank you for that empty tomb, that empty tomb that says we have a future that is greater than our past. I thank you for the resurrection that tells us that our story is long. Lord, my prayer this morning is that if there is someone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that as they think about their, their reputation, that it is that it is not as a follower, as a disciple of Jesus. Lord, I pray that your spirit would move in their heart today, that today could be the first page of a new chapter in their lives, that they could close the book on one and start a book on another to say, my story is going to be different. My story is going to be the one that Jesus wants written. Lord, I pray that those of us, that maybe there's some of us who are holding grudges, who are saying that we have a picture of someone, that we have the idea of who someone is based on one story, one chapter. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to give them grace, to let their story be long, not to spread what's happened in the past, but to look forward to a glorious future for them powered by the gospel. Help us to give grace, and Lord, help us give grace to ourselves. Lord, our, our enemy would want nothing more than to paint us with a brush that leaves us powerless. 
Our enemy wants nothing more to paint us with a brush that makes us too proud to forgive ourselves. It makes us too proud to accept your forgiveness, your mercy, your grace. Your word tells us that if we can believe that we will be blessed, I pray that you would open our hearts to receive that blessing. That you would open our hearts so that we could accept that the story you have for us is longer than we have allowed ourselves. That the story you have for us is better. I pray that your spirit would minister to every heart here at this place. In Jesus' name, amen. We will have a time of invitation. If there's someone you need to talk to, get out your phone, text them right now. Tell them I want to give you the grace to have a longer story. They won't have any idea what that means, but you can tell them later. Maybe right now you need to hit your knees and pray that God will give you the grace to forgive yourself to start a new story today. Maybe you need to start a relationship with Jesus so that your story from here forward can be better than the one from here backwards. This altar is here for things like that. Stand with me, please.